transatlantic flight, an hourly occurrence we take for granted. At 600 miles per hour, today's passengers make the 3,000 mile trip in just over five hours. The Concorde does it in three and a half hours. Less than 70 years ago, man had yet to accomplish this feat. aviation was in its infancy, but its value was quickly recognized by the United States and her allies. Germany had built an unequaled fleet of submarines that ruled the Atlantic. The enemy U-boats attacked transport convoys almost at will, disrupting the movement of troops, equipment and supplies to Europe. An anti-submarine aircraft capable of flying the Atlantic was seen as the answer to convoy protection. Although great strides had been made in aircraft development, engines and fuselages remained inefficient, and no aircraft existed that could meet the Navy's needs. In 1917, David W. Taylor, chief of the Navy's Construction Corps, set out to solve the problem. Entrepreneur Glenn Curtis, who had developed several successful flying boats, was asked to help. And the Curtis facilities at Buffalo, New York were soon deep into design of the needed aircraft. This design, incorporated with a radical hull developed by Commander Holden Richardson, was accepted for the construction of four Navy flying boats. These Navy Curtis, or NC aircraft, were built at the Curtis plant in Garden City, Long Island, and the Lock Body Company in Manhattan. After final assembly at the Naval Air Station in nearby Rockaway, New York, the NC-1 was successfully flown on July 4th, 1918. In one year, the Navy had surpassed three years of combined efforts by England, France, and Italy. Soon, this mammoth aircraft, with its 126-foot wingspan, established new records, carrying 50 men aloft, plus history's first deliberate stowaway. But the end of World War I on November 11th, 1918, eliminated the need for a long-range anti-submarine flying boat. It didn't, however, end the Navy's desire to fly across the ocean. So earlier planning by Lieutenant Richard E. Byrd resulted in continued production work on NCs 1, 2, 3, and 4. Revival of a $50,000 award by the London Daily Mail for the first successful aerial crossing of the Atlantic drew worldwide interest. The United States wanted to be first. Counted among the enthusiasts for this venture was Acting Secretary of the Navy Franklin D. Roosevelt. May 3, 1919, the Navy commissioned Seaplane Division I, making it the first Navy aircraft unit in regular commission. Naval Aviator No. 3, Commander John Henry Towers, was selected for this prestigious command, equivalent to that of a destroyer flotilla. Commander Towers chose NC-3 as his flagship, and designer Commander Holden Richardson as his chief pilot. He appointed Lieutenant Commander Patrick M. L. Bellinger to command NC-1, and Lieutenant Commander M. A. Mitchell his chief pilot. The most junior crew was assigned to NC-4, with Lieutenant Commander Albert C. Reed as commander, and Coast Guard Lieutenant Elmer F. Stone as his chief pilot. Wind and a fire had disabled NC-2, and parts from this aircraft were used to repair others, rendering her unfit for flight. Large as the NCs were, a direct flight from Rockaway to England was beyond their range. Intense research and preparation produced a plan to cross the Atlantic in shorter flights. Rockaway to Nova Scotia, to Newfoundland, to the Azores, to Lisbon, Portugal, and the final leg to Plymouth, England, the ultimate destination. Only primitive navigation and radio communication aids were available. To overcome this problem, more than 50 destroyers would be assigned along the route to fire star shells, smoke their boilers, and offer assistance as needed. 
Additionally, each aircraft carried bow flares for illuminating the sea in case of an emergency night landing. The United States was determined to win the challenge of making the first aerial crossing of the Atlantic. So despite hangar fires and damage from high winds, the NCs were ready for launch as quickly as possible. The NC-4 had been flight tested for only one hour as departure time grew near. But the crew was ready. Plane Commander Albert C. Reed, Chief Pilot Lieutenant Elmer F. Stone, Pilot Lieutenant J.G. Walter Hinton, Radio Operator Ensign H.C. Rod, Engineer Chief Machinist Mate E.H. Howard, Reserve Pilot Engineer Lieutenant J.L. Breeze. On May 7, Chief Machinist Mate Howard lost his hand to a spinning propeller. At the last minute, he was replaced by Chief Machinist Mate Eugene Rhodes. May 8, 10 a.m. With predictions of good weather, the flying boats were off. The formation headed toward Montauk Point and the first stop at Halifax, Nova Scotia. Dropping oil pressure caused the NC-4 crew to kill the center pusher engine. She began to fall behind. Soon another engine failed and she was forced to land at sea. On the water, she lost yet another engine. Unable to communicate with the destroyers, she taxied 80 miles to Naval Air Station Chatham on Cape Cod for repairs. Six days later, May 14th, the NC-4 flew to Halifax, and after more repairs, to Trapassi, Newfoundland, to join the others. Unfavorable weather had kept the NC-1 and NC-3 from departing on the 1,200-mile leg to the Azores. May 16th, the weather finally allowed the three aircraft to leave. But conditions soon deteriorated, and because of rough seas, the destroyers were unable to keep on their assigned stations. Waves had drenched the crew upon takeoff, and salt water had shorted the lights of the NC-3. During the night, fog and poor visibility caused the three planes to lose each other and travel independently. After 15 hours of flight, the slightly faster NC-4 landed safely at Horta in the Azores. A 50-knot tailwind had boosted her average speed to 78 knots. A rousing welcome greeted Lieutenant Commander Reed and the crew. But NC-1 and NC-3 were not as fortunate. Helplessly lost in the fog, each landed in seas much rougher than expected. Then, unable to take off in the high waves, Lieutenant Commander Bellinger's NC-1 was taken in tow by the Greek steamer Ionian. But the plane was soon lost beneath the waves. NC-3 had sustained crippling damage, preventing her return to the air, even if conditions had permitted. After 60 hours of taxiing backwards, Commander Towers and his heroic crew arrived unassisted at their destination, Ponta Delgada. The crew received a tumultuous welcome for their superhuman feat. After two days of weather delays, NC-4 joined NC-3 in Ponta Delgada. The reunion of the two crews sparked a gala celebration but they were still short of their goal. May 27th, NC-4 departed for Lisbon, Portugal, where an even larger reception greeted the first successful flight across the Atlantic. May 31st, NC-4 and her crew arrived at their final destination in Plymouth, England. They were greeted by the Lord Mayor and hundreds of Plymouth citizens on the historic Mayflower Steps. NC-4 had done it. The first transoceanic flight was history. Sixty-seven years later, in May of 1986, the historic flight of the NC-4 is reenacted as part of the celebration of the 75th anniversary of naval aviation. For the reenactment, World War II PBY Catalina flying boats will repeat exactly the first aerial crossing of the Atlantic. Retired Naval Reserve pilot Captain Art Ward located the PBYs. Independence Corps with Admiral Jerry Miller, who is our national chairman of the 75th anniversary of naval aviation. He called and asked me to join the committee, and I told him I wasn't much for committee meetings. 
Well, he said, we had this NC-4 recreation flight, the first crossing the Atlantic, and that really sparked my imagination, and he asked me if I knew anyone that owned a PBY. I said, give me 30 minutes, Admiral. Close to 50 years old, the two privately owned refurbished aircraft contain sophisticated navigation aids, and creature comforts are totally different from the open cockpits of the NC-4. The PBY designated NC-4 sports the same yellow wings and crimson markings as the original. It is owned and piloted by Connie Edwards, a Texas oil man with extensive flying experience. He is the flight commander and spokesman. And uh, being somewhat of an old aviator, I've been flying for 35 years with 15,000 hours of some sort of never, and so uh, it really steps you back in history. The companion flying boat, the gleaming white Spirit of Naval Aviation, is owned and piloted by Robert Franks, a real estate entrepreneur from Los Angeles and former Navy enlisted photographer. Somehow that Texan got hold of me. <laughs> Body? Yeah, I and uh, Lou Peterson from Smithsonian. And uh, when I heard about it, I was uh, really excited because I just finished putting my pain together. Mm -hmm. Appropriately, ceremonies begin at Naval Air Station Pensacola, Florida, where the Navy trains its pilots and where the original NC-4 is preserved in the Naval Aviation Museum. Mrs. Bess Reed, widow of Lieutenant Commander Reed, is on hand for the dedication ceremonies. Well, I'll tell you the thing, I was very quiet. He wasn't a talkative man, but he, he thought. He was a very brilliant man. He was one of honor graduates of the Naval Academy. But he talked about it so much, I thought if he doesn't get that job, I can't stand it, probably. He was determined to get that job. With a little help, the NC-4 is rechristened. Here we go. Here we go. Come on, Ben. Hey! Mrs. Connie Edwards dedicates the reenactment aircraft. And with a proper send-off, the PBYs begin their journey to Rockaway, New York. Stops in Washington, D.C. and New York City allow dignitaries and interested citizens to give official recognition to the aircraft and their crews. Naval Air Station Rockaway, New York, from which the NCs began their flight, no longer exists. Adjacent Floyd Bennett Field serves as a substitute. May 8th, 10 a.m. The PBYs begin their historic reenactment on the same day and at the same time as the original flight. The first leg of the trip is to Naval Air Station South Weymouth, Massachusetts, where the crews are greeted by Captain Robert Peralt and other dignitaries. We are most pleased and most honored to have on board the pilots and the crews of the aircraft recreating Lieutenant Commander A.C. Reed's flight of 1919, initiating the first transatlantic crossing by air. We went a little bit behind schedule. We took off the historic time of uh, 10.02, 10.002 from uh, Rockaway. We flew down uh, the shore, the same uh, same thing that the NC-4 did. Luckily, we didn't break down, though, and have to drift for all night uh, into Chatham. We had quite a cold front move in, and this is roughly the same temperature that those people are flying in. They're flying in open cockpits. They uh, had no more than carpenters levels for, for instruments. And I can just imagine how chilling it would be sitting behind a very, very small windshield with goggles on today, flying along even though the road is going at 75 miles an hour. 
On nearby Cape Cod, a memorial marks the location of former Naval Air Station Chatham, where Lieutenant Commander Reed taxied his NC-4 for repair and replacement of engines before its departure for Halifax. Bands and an air show herald the PBY stop. Along with a visit from former NC-4 mechanic George Goodspeed, now in failing health. And it was his efforts, uh, as well as those uh, others in the crew, that enabled the NC-4 to be repaired and continue on its journey up to Nova Scotia and then on down to the Azores and over across the Atlantic. The aircraft make a fuel stop at Naval Air Station Brunswick, Maine, bringing out scores of interested Navy and civilian spectators. The next leg of the flight to Halifax, Nova Scotia, includes radio contact with Yarmouth, a World War II PBY base. The water landing in Halifax draws large crowds and is duly noted in the traditional manner. Oh, yay! Oh, yay! On behalf of His Worship, Mayor John Savage, the base commander of CFB Shearwater, Colonel Gilles Moray, the Dartmouth councillors, the citizens of our city of Lakes, and the members of the United Canada Aviation Museum, we bid you, the crews of the Cancel's NC-4 and the spirit of U.S. Naval Aviation, a hearty, sunshiny Nova Scotia welcome. At Shearwater Royal Canadian Air Force Base, an appropriately numbered fire truck rinses salt water from the aircraft. May 15th, the PBY NC-4 does a splash and go for the residents of Trepassy, Newfoundland. Hazardous conditions prevent a complete stop, but Mayor Colin Cheater participates as an NC-4 passenger. I think it was great uh, at that time for the people of Trabassi. It showed the American people just how hospitable the people of Trabassi were. And uh, I think that has been paid in kind regard today when uh, we touched down briefly in Trabassi. Due to the hazards of Trapassi Bay and the lack of aviation fuel, St. John's is utilized as the jumping off location for the longest leg of the flight to the Azores. May 17th, the crews depart at dawn. Their modern navigational equipment and radio surveillance replaced the destroyers of 1919. The PBY's relatively modern comforts surpass the exposed cockpits and slatted seats of the NC aircraft. Fair weather and slightly faster speeds of 100 knots make the flight much quicker and easier than Lieutenant Commander Reed's. Aboard the Spirit, an experienced crew assists with the flying. Lou Peterson is a former Navy enlisted pilot and survivor of Pearl Harbor. Ray Bernard is a Canadian flying fireman. And Doris Bindernagel is the flight attendant. Flying duties on NC-4 are shared by Randy Sohn, an airline's jet pilot, and Art Ward, a retired Navy captain with over 10,000 Navy flight hours. Retired Rear Admiral Sigmund Bajak handles navigation and communications. Air Force veteran Al Brown handles all aircraft's maintenance. As with the 1919 flight, a Coast Guard pilot shares the flying. Lieutenant Stone was an early participant in the U.S. Navy flying program. Uh, aside from being Coast Guard aviator number one, I think he was uh, naval aviator number 38 or something like that. And uh, it is a privilege and an honor for me to symbolically represent him today. As the planes near the Azores, modern Navy anti-submarine P-3 aircraft provide an escort. Looks like 5,300 clouds. Following 12 hours in the air, the NC-4 PBY splashes down in Horta Harbor. But the official welcome is at the modern Horta Airport. Clinic, you know, here. <laughs>
Receptions and ceremonies here are capped by a special presentation by Flight Commander Connie Edwards. Greatest honor of my life to present the sword of ACV to the people of uh, Portugal and of Azores. A hero's reception is provided by young and old. Later, at nearby Ponta Delgada, a splash and go is followed by an airport reception. Children eagerly visit the airplanes. school, they display their enthusiasm and interest in the historic flight. <laughs> Even in modern times, this beautiful volcanic island retains much of the charm of 1919. The last stop in the Azores is for maintenance and refueling at Lodges Field. It also provides the setting for a middle-of-the-night meeting with then-Chief of Naval Operations, James D. Watkins. It's uh, great to be here and great to look on these two old birds. I used to fly in periodically when I was a youngster. Joining the crew in the Azores is veteran aviator and author Martin Caton. May 27th. Following the 1919 flight schedule, the planes arrive on time in Lisbon, Portugal. One can almost hear Lieutenant Commander Reed's crisp, to-the-point radio message. We are safely across the pond. The job is finished. Celebrations in Lisbon include an airport ceremony. May this trip contribute to the strengthening of the existing close ties between North America and Europe, and in particular, between the United States of America and Portugal and a water landing at the 460-year-old tower of Baileem on the Tejo River. After a night in Santiago, Spain, near where Lieutenant Commander Reed and his crew spent the last evening of their epic journey, the flight continues to the last stop in England. <laughs> May 31st. The PBY NC4 completes the reenactment of the 1919 flight as she lands in Plymouth Sound. But even today there is risk in flying. As the PBY Spirit is landing, it strikes a buoy and suffers damage. Fortunately, only one passenger is slightly injured. Rapid action by Royal Navy and Marine units and the Plymouth Harbor Master keep the effects of the accident to a minimum, as Spirit settles in only five feet of water. Four months later, she will be airworthy and return to America. With Spirit slightly dampened by the mishap, the NC4 crew is greeted by the Lord Mayor of Plymouth. But the purpose of the flight is to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the United States Air Command and has been chosen as the event to commemorate the anniversary since the journey culminated in our city. As in 1919, the ceremony is held at the Mayflower Steps, the very spot from which the Pilgrim Fathers embarked for the New World nearly 370 years before. Loved England. I've spent a lot of time over here. I flew in the battle. Remarks by Connie Edwards summarize the crew's feelings. All I can say is that England is one of our oldest enemies and by far our best friend, and that just kind of tells it all. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I salute you. The reenactment of the flight of NC-4 celebrates more than a milestone of naval aviation. It underscores the resourcefulness, daring, and determination of military pilots to accomplish their mission despite the odds against them. 
Charles A. Lindbergh, who made the first solo flight across the Atlantic eight years later, said of the NC-4 crew, I stood a better chance of making it than the NC-4. I had a more reliable engine, improved instrumentation, and a continent instead of an island for a target. I have nothing but great admiration for their historic accomplishment. The Nancy boats proved it could be done. The dream is achieved. The commitment continues.